Lynn and I are often surprised by the unusual niches that Vancouver fills in the world. Did you know that Vancouver is respected by international aficionados of the harpsichord? Thanks mostly to our next guest. The harpsichord is an important instrument of our history. And though it peaked in the late 1700s, it still maintains a devoted and enthusiastic following, believe me. If you want a harpsichord built or repaired, Vancouver is the place you want to be. Please welcome Craig Tarmlinson. When my son was probably about two years old, we were walking through, I think it was Park Royal Shopping Center, and he, he saw his first piano and was looking at it. What kind of harpsichord is that? <laughs> so I'd like to uh, thank Sam and Lynn for this opportunity. It's, uh, it's a wonderful salon that you put on. Uh, so how did I ever get into harpsichord making? Well, it wasn't a conscious decision. Uh, uh, I think Kate's speech at the beginning just kind of covered every, every base. Uh, uh, anyways, um, I started off quite young. I was uh, 16 years old when I, I started building uh, folk instruments. Uh, I had seen my first harpsichord when I was 10 years old um, and was quite intrigued by it. And I saw a, a violin maker the same day, the first time I ever saw a violin maker. So I think something clicked or snapped or something. I'm not sure what. Um, so as a, a folk musician back in the 60s, I decided that I would like to have a, a, a dulcimer to play. And there were no dulcimers to be had in Vancouver. So I thought I had a little picture from one of the encyclopedias. Uh, that I cut out and um, tried to make a, a, a dulcimer. Well, a year and a half later, I had a dulcimer that kind of worked, sort of. Um, so I thought, well, why not build another one? So I, I decided to build a, a few more after that, and a few more after that, and kind of morphed until I was thinking after a year and a half, I need a bigger project. <laughs> so uh, at that point, I met two people who kind of changed my life a, a bit. Um, uh, and luckily, they needed a housemate. They were renting a place in Kitsilano. One was Doreen Oak and the other Ray Nurse. Ray was a, an absolute fantastic uh, builder of uh, really early music instruments, so lutes, uh, later on, uh, violones and, um, and violas, viola de gambas. Um, so I kind of got into that sphere a bit. Uh, Doreen was, at the time, uh, teaching harpsichord, and she had a, a, a wonderful kit instrument around the house, and so I was able to kind of poke at it and find out what it was all about. Uh, so a few years later, she had quite a few students, and I was asked to, uh, if I could build some harpsichords for them. So I thought, well, this is the bigger project that I wanted. Um, so there was a, a few harpsichord kit makers, uh, mostly in the eastern states and in, in the Boston area. And uh, luckily, I was able to get a few of those, and I assembled the kits. And uh, I think I must have assembled six or seven kits. And then I, I thought, well, I kind of need a bigger project. Um, and I could see kind of the limitations. They were using some woods that I really didn't like the sound of. So at that point, I met uh, two people, uh, Ted Turner on Pender Island, who at that time was a draftsman for the Edinburgh Collection, which is one of the best um, collections in Europe of uh, keyboard instruments, early keyboard instruments. Uh, and so I worked with Ted for about two years, kind of off and on. And then I was introduced to John Phillips in Berkeley, California. And so I was able to go down and work with him for a few more years. Now, I really liked Ted's sound. He had a wonderful sound in his instruments, but they kind of lacked a bit. Uh, these instruments have to work perfectly every time. It's kind of like your car. You want it to be able to operate every single time you sit down to play it or to drive it. Uh, but John's instruments worked amazingly well, but I didn't really like his sound so much. So I thought, well, I think it's time to go out on my own. So I moved back to Vancouver from Berkeley and set up my own shop. So the, the dream that I had was to uh, have something that works perfectly well and uh, requires almost no maintenance, and you can drive it anytime you want, and it sounds great, kind of like a good sports car. So uh, this, this instrument is a French two-manual harpsichord. Um, this is <laughs> what came out of building for 40 years, I guess. Uh, finally, I figured out how to do it properly. Um, the harpsichord is different from the piano, not only in the fact that it's about 1,400 pounds lighter, 
than a modern Grand, uh, but it's, it's very, very lightly built. Uh, it's lightly strong, it's very open and airy in its sound. Uh, it's much like a guitar or a lute or something, it's, it's, or a violin is a, is a really good example. Um, when the revival started in the 50s and 60s, uh, the, the manufacturers were making the harpsichords more like pianos. Uh, very, very heavy, heavy structures, and there was almost no sound that came out of them. So the idea was to go back uh, to what the original instruments were being, uh, the original instruments back in the 14, 15, 16, 17, and 1800s. Um, they were built very light, very responsive, and they had a huge sound compared to what was coming out of these modern uh, instruments. So uh, it was, I was able to achieve that. Um, so the, the woods that I use on these, I, I have gone to the sources in Europe and pretty much looked through the, uh, the forest and, and come up with logs and uh, have the logs cut up and then sent back to uh, North America. And so the, the sound boards in particular are really what creates the sound and uh, they're made of a very lively uh, spruce from, well this one is from Mittenwald in southern Bavaria, as is the Italian, as are most violins and uh, cellos, basses, things like that. They're all kind of from the same area and the same type of, of uh, spruce. So uh, this kind of represents the, the apex of, of the harpsichord world. Uh, this one ended up as 63 notes. It's just over five octaves, which is what the, uh, the modern, modern uh, harpsichords were at that time uh, when they started to, to lose favor in the 1800s. Uh, right around 1800, uh, the piano took over, um, which is kind of nice because I built forte pianos as well, which is, is what took over from this one. Uh, and that's kind of a different boat altogether. Uh, they're, they are slightly uh, heavier built than, the, than these, but uh, the harpsichords are really, really what I love to build. Um, over here, there's an Italian harpsichord, so it's kind of like the French, but it, uh, it's, it's much smaller, and it has a completely different sound to it as well. This is a more reedy sound, I'll just... And the French instrument. I'm not gonna do a demonstration because uh, uh, Alex Weiman here was here two years ago and did a wonderful demonstration. It has a really nice treble to it too. Kind of a crystal clear treble. So basically the, uh, uh, the mechanism that uh, is in the harpsichord is called a jack. And I brought along a large jack here so you can actually see what happens. So pretend my finger is the, is the, uh, the string. Well, what happens is uh, the key lever will be depressed. It'll shove the, the jack up into the air and at the same time it'll pluck the string. And then what happens is this will just fold back and it sits on the damper on the way down. So it's very, very simple but it has to work absolutely perfectly well. So it's really important. So I've been asked to uh, bring a, a few slides along of what actually happens in the building process. Uh, this is in, uh, in Europe, in uh, Berlin actually. Uh, going through a collection, I pick out what instrument I actually want to be working on. And then I'll, uh, at the, usually at the museum, I'll uh, write up a little manual with all the dimensions of everything I, I want to be putting into it. Um, and you can see from the manual that I'm a typical Canadian. I'll have half of it is in imperial and the rest is in metric. So <laughs> what can I say? I have my son working for me right now and um, he kind of looks at it and just shakes his head, I think. <laughs> um, then next I'll, I'll set up, uh, draw up a set of uh, quick plans and uh, then it's off to the shop to, uh, to start the work process. And uh, pretty soon, we just started uh, two French doubles, much like in the photograph right there. We started uh, two days ago, and uh, it, it'll go into paint and just very quickly, then it gets into gilding and gold leafing, and there's a lot of gilding that uh, goes on in, in the instrument. It's one of my favorite things to do. Just, you end up with gold all over the floor and you end up vacuuming it up in the vacuum cleaner at the end. Uh, then the keyboards. Uh, keyboards are reverse, uh, ebony ax or naturals and uh, bone accidentals. Luckily there was never any uh, ivory in them, so I, I was lucky in that, that respect. And all the internal working parts, jacks, things like that. And there's a, a harpsichord on the side and the finished instrument. 
Uh, so total process is really about four months from start to finish, but we always do multiples in there. Um, what I want to say also, just at the very, very end to wrap things up, is that um, I've been in many, many cities in the world working in, in different areas, Paris, London, Edinburgh, that's the capital, um, and, and San Francisco, but Vancouver is really one of the best spots to do what I'm doing because it's, it's small enough that I can get around and, and pick up materials and not spend a whole day you know, running out to the airport and doing all of that. But also the, uh, the climate is wonderful too for harpsichords. Um, we have the nice dry summers, uh, not the high humidity that we really get in the back, uh, back east and in Japan and places like that. So it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And of course, what better thing to do on those rainy months uh, is to sit in your workshop producing uh, harpsichords. <laughs> <laughs> but really, above uh, everything else, it's the artistic community that's fantastic. And over the years, I've had a wonderful symbiotic relationship with Early Music Vancouver. Uh, and really, it's been, it's been fabulous because uh, without me, no harpsichords to play without them no one's going to play the harpsichord. So it's, it's absolutely wonderful. But also, uh, we've got Vancouver Recital Society. Uh, uh, we're bringing in, in uh, instrumentalists and organizations, orchestras from all over the world. As uh, The Bach Collegium from Japan is in the photograph right now. Um, Vancouver Opera, Jonathan Darlington, the conductor, was uh, originally started off as a uh, traveling harpsichordist in, in Europe. And finally, Alex Weiman from Pacific Baroque Orchestra, who's also under uh, Early Music Vancouver. And of course, uh, last but not least, the public salon. So we're really blessed to be in this city. Thank you very much.